Ah, the budget portable gaming experience of the 1980s. So thrilling and just plain awful. What I would have done for a game... What? So this is what happens when you hold on to a memory you probably should have let go a long time ago. And it may have been 34 years in the making, but I've finally built a portable system of my childhood dreams. My name is Downing, and this is my Tiger Boy Advance. To say there's a lot going on in the portable making world these days would be a gross understatement. Modders like Wesk and G-Man continue to push the technical aspects of the hobby to their limits, while new companies, like 4Layer Tech, make these advances available to the general public. This has pushed the hobby to a more mainstream audience than it's ever been before, and has also pushed the complexity higher than it's ever been before as well. And then there's me, modding like it's 2012 again, and I just took an already portable system and made it into a bigger portable system. Yeah. So what are these Tiger handheld things? Essentially they were the poor man's version of the Nintendo Game Boy of the late 80s. They were single game units which were usually based off movies or console games at the time. But their adaptations were a little substandard. Like, they sucked. <laughs> their graphics were basically electronic shadow puppets, and the audio was limited to basic digital bleeps and bloops that didn't take very long to become just plain annoying. And the controls? Well, just looking at them could piss you off before you even turned it on. But that's what you had back then if your pockets weren't deep enough for the real Nintendo shit. And it may be that there's some underlying animosity at the fact I could not afford an original Game Boy until years later, but that's what brought me back to this design, because now I was able to make it exactly what I wanted from the start. So the main goal was to take the form of the old school Tiger handheld and merge it with the power of the Game Boy Advance. But also adding Game Boy Advance upgrades like the funny playing IPS screen and a USB-C rechargeable battery pack. So essentially, this isn't much more than a case mod with a few hardware upgrades. But it's one I wanted to keep as close to the original Tiger design as I could. I've included timestamps in the description below that'll jump right to the finished project. But if you want to see what it took to get to this point, stick around. But if you do happen to already be there, don't forget to give this video a like and give this channel a new sub. So as far as the enclosure and the case design was concerned, this seemed like it was going to be a pretty straightforward project. And then I remembered that I was going to be involved. In which case, something was bound to fail in some unknown and unexplainable fashion. Just the way it works. The design process was relatively similar to my normal routine. However, there were a couple of differences I had to account for in the form of new printing materials and the fact that this enclosure would not be 100% 3D printed. Unlike most of my enclosures, the overall size of the Tiger case meant it was possible to fit each case half on my Form 3. But this is something I'm not a fan of doing because SLA printing, in my experience, does not hold its shape well when stretched over long, thin walls. This was until after recently printing a larger enclosure for a modding buddy of mine named Shockslayer. To try and combat the warping issue, we used a new-to-me material called Rigid 4000, which is a glass-filled resin that even touted its structural abilities for holding thin walls in check. Initially, I was very impressed, so I put it to the test by printing some insanely thin walls and flat planes, just hoping I had found a solution to this thin wall problem. No. 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 Of course, I had done a fit, form, and function test on the FDM 3D printer before printing an SLA. Unfortunately, there is no real way to test how the final material is going to work unless you print with the final material. So despite the test prints, which were still extremely helpful in tweaking the case design before going to SLA, I ended up having to reprint the front half three freaking times. That got old real quick. But these reprints did give me a chance to learn some workarounds with some of these issues with the resin like for example adjusting plane thicknesses and adding support ribs. And honestly, this was the first time I actually had to use real engineering in a case design to get around known issues with the process. The best part of this build though was getting the chance to try something new. And in this case, the custom made screen protector was a jump into new waters for me. Making it took a little bit of everything I've learned over the years in fabrication and threw in the novelty of digital printing. I mean, when you look at this, you really wouldn't think there'd be a whole lot to go into making this part. 
couple of 2D cuts, and then some graphics printing. Simple, right? Again, no! So let's take a look at the steps that were involved in making this, specifically getting the screen protector from idea to physical form where everything actually lined up the way it was supposed to. So the first thing I needed was an actual 3D model of the piece. This was done at the time of the enclosure design, and careful scaling had to be done because of the size of the IPS screen. The screen is actually a fair bit bigger than the Tiger Display's original, and because of this, the whole handheld ended up having to be bigger than the original as well. The second step was exporting a DXF file for a toolpath and scaled outlines for Photoshop. Once I had my outline, I was ready for the graphic design. I then had to come up with some kind of design that would complement both systems. This was one of the more enjoyable parts of the project, and once the masks and clips had been sorted out, getting creative on the design was a great throwback to my earlier days. Once I had a design I was satisfied with, I then had to bring it to the professionals. The next step was to convert my design into the correct print and CNC layout. So this is where I have to give a ton of credit to my new co-workers at Megaprint. The first person I need to thank is our graphic designer, Gail. She was able to take my mess of a graphic and import, layout, and export all the print and cut files that the job was going to need later in the process. The next step was to print the graphics on the screen protector and was where I also learned how important using the right material for the job is. Because I was just using mostly what I had available to me, the only material that really fit the bill was a sheet of 16th inch acrylic. While this was ideal for the physical piece, typically for ink to bond to an acrylic properly, it needs a special coating which it did not have. So the second shout out goes to Brendan, the operator of this beast of a printer, whose knowledge and patience were key in getting this printed. The tasks in this case were to do what was called a reverse or mirrored print, which meant that we were going to be printing on the back side of the media and the image would show through the front. To make that work, the image had to be flipped. Easy. But as I said before, not using the correct material would soon come back to bite us. And with the six good copies we had printed, it was now time to move on to the CNC machine. Getting back into CNC has been a blast over these past few months, and learning a new machine and software has been very helpful in many ways. But in this case, I was about to throw in a new variable that I'd never seen before, and that of course was milling a pre-printed part on media that was not designed to be printed to begin with, much less subjected to heat and friction. And as you can see, the results were far less than optimal. The combination of the heat and the narrow spans between the edges and the buttons pretty much caused the ink to peel right off. So we were going to have to think outside the box a little bit to make this work. And though it wasn't the easiest solution, we were actually able to CNC out the faceplates first and then print them after they were cut. And now it's time for the easy part. Putting everything together where everything was just going to fit and work on the first try. Ha! <laughs> no, it was an even bigger nightmare than the damn case printing. Once the casing was finally settled, printed, and painted cleanly, the next hassle became the assembly, which for the first time in a very long while, did not use custom PCBs for anything. And I'd forgotten how much that really complicates things. I ran into nearly every obstacle there was to run into during this assembly, which caused a ton of rework, specifically the front tack buttons and the D-pad. This is where I sorely missed the ease and reliability of custom PCBs because, man, these put up a frickin' fight. But eventually, after several F-bombs, everything started to feel acceptable and respond the way it was intended. So here it is! The Tiger Boy Advance. An upgraded and recased Game Boy Advance which would have been the ultimate portable dream of its time. And though this is by no means flawless, for a first version that tackled many unknowns, I'm not gonna complain. Well, maybe just a little. I mean, certain parts of this were a lot more difficult than they really needed to be, while others I can understand and justify why they took so long. But D-pads, tack switch buttons, pretty standard stuff for a guy who's been doing this for 12 years. Anyway, let's bring you around the system a little bit and let you see what's what. So on the front we've got our standard interface. The B, A, and D-pad buttons for controls. Start, select, backlight plus and backlight minus buttons, which also double as an extra set of L and R buttons. On the back we've got the card slot, the R and L buttons, and an LED backlit decal, along with six recessed screw mounts that hold the case together. The original GBA only had mono out, and this uses a upgraded 28mm Mylar speaker for the main audio, as well as a relocated headphone jack and volume wheel. So these features really rounded out the style of the Tiger handhelds. And the upgraded funny playing IPS screen and the 1500mAh USB-C rechargeable battery pack gave a huge upgrade to the Game Boy Advance itself and when combined came out with a concept that I was really happy with. And while it's no analog pocket by any means, a grudge still held from my childhood has now been settled. 
And maybe one day I'll actually be able to play it if I can get it out of the hands of this kid. Oh, I did not caught it. And with that, we've reached the end of the video. But before we go, I need to give a shout out to the owner at Megaprint, Tim. Without his help and willingness to test our capabilities, we wouldn't have seen this screen bezel turn out the way it did. And to Mega Mike. You may have noticed a new intro animation at the beginning of this video. Well, he's the guy to thank for that. And as always, I want to thank you guys so much for stopping by and checking out the video. Also be sure to check out downingsbasement.com, my Twitter, and my Discord server for more information, and just hang out and say hi. Later guys, thank you. Jesus Christ, this is really weird. Yeah. All right. People flushing the goddamn toilets every time I hit record. Where's the fucking drink?